Kelton Hatch joins us on a monthly basis from Idaho Fish and Game, sometimes a bit more often when there's a uh, a topic that comes up that's obviously important to folks in the Magic Valley. Uh, but he's here for his, uh, his hour-long monthly visit, which means he's got time for some telephone calls from all of you. And I thank you for joining us this morning. Right now it is 66, and coming up on 7 minutes after 9 o'clock, Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story. And first of all, welcome back. Hey, thanks. Appreciate we, you having me. Can we talk? I know you mentioned something about wildlife here. Two things. Maybe we can move this. I, you've got the outline, but maybe we can move down to the mountain lion uh, that tried to grab the little girl the other day. Plus, as I understand, up near McCall, they've closed a campground because of uh, bear activity. Yeah. So got a couple of people when they're out and about, got to remember that we're dealing with some wild animals in places like Idaho. And, and it is, you know, and I mean, uh, mountain lion attacks are very few and far between. However, uh, 99% of these mountain lion attacks um, occur um, with young cats that have just been kicked off uh, the female. They're trying to figure out a way to survive. Um, a lot of the bigger habitat areas or habitat areas up in the mountains are taken by uh, adult males and, and adult lions. And uh, they may not be as good at hunting as they should be. And because of that, I mean, several cats, predators, I mean, die frequently from either injuries sustained from uh, trying to uh, take animals or they're just not good enough to get it done. And then they get weak and they get to be worse at it. And that's looks like this. That's what would happened with this. A little girl was uh, over in the Rexburg area and they were in the Green Canyon hot springs uh, drainage. And they'd seen this cat earlier in the day. had been working around the camp. Um, that night they were sitting around a campfire cooking, and the cat came in and grabbed the girl. The, everybody jumped up and screamed and ran at it. And it dropped the girl and uh, took off. And uh, Fish and Game came in uh, and investigated it. They got a hound hunter there. The cat was treed, and then it was uh, killed by the sheriff's department over there. Um you know, we've received a lot of, a lot of people have been upset the cat was killed and, you know, how do you know that it was the right one? But we, we go through painstaking uh, methods, you know, 95% of the time, again, if an animal, I've been on uh, two or three other uh, attacks on livestock and one on a kid when I was um, up in Montana and the, the, when I was at in Montana, the cat was found less than 20 yards from where the child had been attacked earlier that day, like an hour and a half. A lot of times they'll stay near that area because, well, they found some prey once. It may come back or they may right. can get to what they had attacked already in, in, it, when things die down. And so, um, But we were able to verify it was the cat that had attacked her from DNA evidence or just looking at the cat uh, from uh, evidence collected. The DNA takes too long to, you know, but, um, and then on the bear up north on the campground, uh, that's really common. Um, people have been using these campgrounds all summer. It's getting hot and dry. Food's hard to find. Um, but that, you know, hamburger smells pretty good. And so do those hot dogs and s'mores and all the crap the kids have been flipping out in the bushes that they haven't been eating and all the drippings from whatever you've been cooking on the fire. And, uh, you know, they're hungry. It's simple. They don't have to chase it down. It's right there. So if you want to be safe in your campgrounds, clean up. Um, don't put your tents near campfire rings and stuff like that if you're camping. You should have your camp away from where you cook um, because that will attract animals, skunks and bears and other things. But if you do or if you are in a situation you have a bear coming into camp, get a hold of us so that we can go up and take care of it. I wanted to say uh, we have Kelton in studio for an hour, and some of those telephone callers, I uh, will get to you in the, probably the next couple of segments. But in the meantime, we've got a lot of ground to cover with him while he's here today as well. It's already 11 minutes after 9 o'clock. So the, the the top thing you actually had on the list here was hunting season's underway. Yeehaw! <laughs> Good time. Was it was a high yee, you bet. you got to love it. <laughs> My throat's gone. I've been at the Casher County Fair talking to people about hunting all week and looking at some big bucks that have it's been... fair season, too. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> looking at some uh, nice deer that have been harvested over in 55 on the early velvet hunt. Um, you know, we've just got hunts going all on all around us. Uh, pronghorn hunters are out in the desert right now uh, chasing pronghorns with their bows. We have several elk hunts going on right now. And so, uh, and then uh, 
a few of these early velvet uh, type mule deer hunts in 39 above Boise and over by uh, Featherville in that area and then uh, down here in 55 by uh, Burley. So it is a season, but I had a couple of dates I want to run by you. We just had a second draw. People that, uh, a lot of our tags, um, we had we had leftover tags. People either drew the tag and then didn't pick it up, and so it went back into the kitty, or some of the hunts weren't completely filled, not enough applications. So we had a second draw. That draw closed on the 15th. We're guessing that we should have results for the second draw out by the 20th. We will at least by the 23rd. But um, we're hoping to have them out by the 20th. Any leftover tags that were not drawn on in the second draw will go on sale on the 25th at 10 a.m. Those tags go really fast. Um, there's usually a few youth uh, antlerless tags. Um, those numbers have really dropped off in the last few years. I think last year we had 10 or 15 tags. It was all that went on sale. But, um, but those will go on sale on the 25th at 10 a.m. Dove season starts on the September 1st. Got waterfowl season on October 15th. Uh, bear and wolf season opens August 30th. Elk archery and deer archery seasons um, open August 30th with uh, horse grouse starting uh, that weekend also. And so it, it, we're right in the heat of things. I mean, it, I love it this time of year because until then, it seems like we're going 400 different directions. Right. We're trying to get all our ducks in a row. We're trying to get ready for hunting season. We're trying to get everything around. Finally, hunting season gets here, and we can kind of get single focused, working and talking to hunters. I had, and I love that. had an old boss. He loved duck hunting. That was his favorite thing to do. Everybody that I know that hunts usually has one favorite animal season. What's yours? You know, I, I've... For so many years, I was such a hardcore uh, elk hunter. Loved elk. We just didn't have elk where I grew up. Then I kind of moved into mule deer, and I've been really into mule deer, bighorn sheep for several years. Now I'm getting a little older. Uh, I'm back. I like. I've always liked hunting birds, but I do more bird hunting now. They're easier to pack out. <laughs> so you know, but I, I still love going up with my kids, big game hunting. But my my two favorite out of everything in the outdoors probably big game hunting. Still love hunting big mule deer. And like chasing bighorn sheep, if I can get over, get friends that draw tags or if I can draw a tag, and then bird hunting. Bird hunting, though, is what really requires, I think, more skill because they're usually moving and they're moving fast. Well, you know, maybe on the shooting end, uh, one thing, it, it's kind of a time commitment thing for me is because when I, right when I, all my, when I, I was in the middle of raising children, um, most of my, two of my kids are out of the house now, but... Um, I just didn't have time for good dogs because it, it, I mean, it's a full-time commitment if you're having the dogs where you really want them, you know, at least for me. And I, I and uh, people can go out and have a lot of fun with their, their, any dog just getting out there, wandering around, looking for stuff. But uh, for me, it's more of a time commitment. I really like, really like to have my dogs working. And it's more about the dog work than um, actually harvesting things. I just like walk, watching those dogs run big and, and find birds, and so it's kind of fun. Yeah, my next-door neighbor, when I was a kid, he'd come over work and spend a couple of hours every night, even before dinner, working with his dogs. Oh, yeah. I run my dogs twice a day just to keep them legged up. You know, that's a real important thing right now is uh, rattlesnakes are out hot right now still um, in the hills, so if you're exercising your dogs, be really cautious on that. But it is time to get your horses in shape. It's time to get you in shape. Probably a month ago, you should have started doing that, and it's time to get your dogs and and all your livestock, horses, dogs, and yourself into shape for hunting season because, I mean, everything's just around the corner. If you want to go out and have the best time you can, it's always a lot funner if you can hike the hills and only cough up half a lung (laughs) instead of the entire lung. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, taking a walk around the neighborhood at night and, and stuff like that can help you quite a bit. You've got another item here. We've got a few minutes before the first break. A youth clinic, uh, upcoming youth clinic, and uh, maybe we can get a few details about that in before the uh, for the next break. You bet. I really wanted to push this. Uh, we've got about twenty some odd, twenty five kids, and um, some adults signed up. We're having a youth clinic on Saturday from eight to noon to help kids sight in their hunting rifles. Mm-hmm. 
as well as giving some pointers on uh, shotgun shooting and archery shooting. We're going to be at the Drome Rod and Gun Club. Call us at the regional office if you want your uh, your youth or first-time hunters to have some help sighting. We've got about eight guys that are going to be over there, 100 instructors uh, that are going to be over there to help people sight in their rifle at the rifle range. Um, and then um, we've got some uh, NRA-certified uh Shotgun shooters that are going to be there to help give some pointers on for waterfowl and and just typical shotgun shooting will have trap over there. You need to bring your own ammunition and your own firearm because what this is is to help you be the best you can be with your 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 guns that you own so that you know where they're shooting and how they're function and uh, making sure you're hitting what you're supposed to. And so it's going to be a great opportunity. But give us a call three two four. Four three five nine, and just say, "Hey, I'm looking at. I want to come over to this uh, this uh, youth clinic or this uh, firearms uh, site in day, and we'll help you out. It doesn't need to be just youth. I mean, anybody that's interested in sighting in their rifle and want a little bit of help, uh, give us a holler, and fact, we'll be there from eight to noon on Saturday. Practice is obviously it's important because oh, it is. You know, that's what we talked about earlier. Skill you have to have. You just you know, without it, um, mm-hmm. you're just wasting a lot of ammunition. Oh, it is. And the single biggest frustrating thing when I talk to fathers with first-time youth hunters, it's been a long time since they've been hunting. And sometimes the kids aren't quite as familiar with the, uh, the firearms. They have a rough time uh, with a sight acquisition, trying to find the animal in the scope. Anytime you can get that kid out there shooting, it helps them become more comfortable with it. Uh, your wives, if they haven't been hunting a lot, uh, I mean, even first time uh, adult, anybody that's first time hunter, it just takes, it's a, your, your adrenaline's up a little bit. You see what you're hunting. You have to be able to settle down, be able to find it in your scope, be able to make a good clean shot because I mean, we want to be really ethical. We want to be the most humane that we can be, um, with this. And, uh, so you want a good clean kill. And the way you do that is by practice. We want to point out Kelton Hatch is with us until 10 o'clock this morning. We've got a break coming up in just a few seconds. But if you've got a question or comment for him, too, as well, feel free to give us a telephone call uh, following these messages. The telephone number, uh, if you most of you know it, but in case you haven't written it down at some point, it's 736-0300. When I tell people to put it in speed dial, you realize that's kind of outdated now because people put it in a cell phone, but they don't really have speed dial. Well, you got hotkeys. You got your favorites. And there so you go. Throw it in your favorites, and then you can just click over there and put a picture of you in there so that yes. they know. <laughs> Frightening small children everywhere. Yeah. We've got more coming up in just a few minutes on News Radio 1310 KLIX. Our studio guest is Kelton Hatch. He is here from Idaho Fish and Game until 10 o'clock this morning, 924, and right now it is 67. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. And of course, you can reach us at News Radio 1310 KLIX. And NewsRadio1310.com by calling 736-0300. If you've got a question or comment for Kelton while he's uh, in the studio with us, uh, sage grouse season set. Now, got to remember that we're talking greater sage grouse or just sage grouse, or we've got government interference here. What's going on? <laughs> these, these are our local local sage grouse, <laughs> and so we just got we've got a se- season set. Um, we usually wait every year, and it's not in our regular. Uh, Upland game regulations, but it's going to be September 17th through the 23rd, one bird bag limit, daily bag limit. So it's going to be open for that one week. Um, and uh, closed areas are the, I'll just let you grab a hold of one of these regulations. You can go online and pick them up, or you can stop by one of the regional offices. And we'll try to get them out to some of our licensed vendors. But I just wanted people to know that sage grouse season this year will be from the 17th to the 23rd. Um, on that so not a lot more we had good good nesting success i mean good lek count numbers breeding ground uh, numbers this year um, we were down just a little bit in some areas on chick survival but um it looks like it should be a fairly good season we have a caller with us caller you're on the air with kelton hatch on klix i know in the news there's a lot of uh talk about the the college basketball tournament season and how much time is is lost to uh, discussion and polls and and all those kinds of things but I, I guarantee you that in Idaho 
we lose way more time on hunting season than we do on basketball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that I call it a loss of time, though. <laughs> I mean, it's time well spent. <laughs> and I, I'll add to that, too. Uh, we talk more rodeo than basketball here as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do like March Madness, but, you know, hunting season still, I'd, I'd probably have to go with that. <laughs> Very true. Uh, and, and speaking Appreciate of that caller. Sage grouse. I asked somebody one time if they knew what it tasted like. I said, is it like chicken? And they said, no. Not even close. It's very dark meat. Um, it, it's very dark meat. I like it. I grew up on it. Ninety. My wife calls it flying liver. <laughs> um, she doesn't care for sharp tail. She doesn't care for sage grouse. They're really dark. Um, typically what I'll do with them is either, uh, typically what I do with it is, is make finger steaks out of it. Another kind of Western right. <laughs> phenomenon. Strip it, pound it, bread it fry it anything's good like that especially with onions and mushrooms and a little dipping sauce and so i really like them like that um I, but i grew up on them my grandmother used to bake them for us um, but they are really a dark meat we used to do that with smelt where we would just roll it in the breading and then fry it up fry and, the whole uh, thing yeah it looked just a little stick of smelt tasted yeah. great yeah yeah and so no where there's a will there's a way and we don't harvest a lot of them but i like i wanted my kids to be able to have that opportunity because you know, numbers are looking better, and they continue to go, but you just, we're really monitoring sage grass close. The other thing we're really concerned about is, of course, this fire season, and that's impacted certain areas of the state. Uh, it has been very dry the last couple of months, and some oh, big been, concerns there. It is. It's scary right now, and, and what we wanted to do is just um, warn people, uh, be very cognizant of what's going on around you. Um I was talking to a friend yesterday at the Casual County Fair that had stopped by the booth. He actually put out two campfires this week um, up in Father Son's campground in the South Hills that people had left burning. And, um, you know, that's we, we really need to be cognizant. You shouldn't be running your ATVs or motorcycles without baffles on them, spark arresters. Um, you need to you need to have that. You shouldn't be parking your vehicle in tall grass. Um, it's a tinder box out there right now, as we're seeing up in Loman, and so uh, people need to be really careful with that. But uh, can I jump back to one thing? I was going to mention one other thing on these sage grouse. Sure. A lot of people have asked us why we have a hunting season on sage grouse because they they're they're listed. Well, they're petitioned to be listed, and numbers aren't what they were. Harvest. On sage grouse is very, very minimal. I can't remember the number, um, but compared to the overall populations, it's very minimal. The biggest thing is, is if a person's able to participate in something, it makes it important to them. We get more support by harvesting a few because we've got a lot of people interested in sage grouse. They get to participate in hunting, hunting them, and I think it's made them a better steward over over. Uh, the area. They're very cognizant. Everybody knows about sage grouse. Um, and those people that hunt them are very concerned and are more apt to show support on doing things to ensure the future of them. And that's why we maintain a hunting season with them. And so, and I think it's paid off in dividends because uh, the people that still hunt them really, and they really love the bird just because it's it's kind of to me. It should be Idaho State bird in some ways because <laughs> you know when I when I think of Idaho and the deserts and and working cattle growing up, I always I, I think of sage grass out there. I, I mean, you see the mountain bluebird all over the place, but I remember those big old bombing uh, sage grass as a kid just as well as anything else. So more with Kelton Hash coming up in just a minute. He's here from Idaho Fishing Game. He'll take more of your telephone calls too in the next half hour. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It is 68 at 930. Kelton Hatch is in the studio with us, joining us from Idaho Fishing Game this morning, and he's also available to take some of your questions or comments. The telephone number 736 300. Bill Colley with you as well. Hey, just a quick reminder, too, coming up next Wednesday on the program between 8 30 and 9 o'clock. We're going to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Tripp from Tripp Family Medicine uh, or one of his associates, and we talk about a medical issue every week. It's called Better Health with Tripp Family Medicine, the office on Fillmore Street directly across from the main post office in Twin Falls. And just a reminder, they are still looking for new patients, and they can often see you on the very same day if you call early in the morning and 
you have a need to get some medical attention. Uh, it's 934, and we have a caller with us. Caller, you're on the air with Kelton Hatch. Good morning. Uh, like so many hunters out there, I use my, my quad runner for hunting. Uh, I bought both my grandkids' quad runners. They're both young. I know they've taken their on course, uh, on computer course tests. But they also have to take a optical course test. Is that something a fishing game does, or uh, is that another department to contact for that? Thank you. That that would be another department. We uh, w- the only thing that we implement is hunting rules, and so that would be with the land management agency. And I really don't know what the rules. I appreciate the call, but I really don't uh, understand know the rules that goes along with youth driving those. Whether they have to have a driver's license or what classes they need to go. All I know is. As long as they're safe, they'll be happy. Used to be on your own property, I guess you could do it, right? You could do it. And then they've got some other rules, but I'm, I'm guessing it would be with either uh, Parks and Rec or BLM or maybe Forest Service. I, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd probably start with Parks and Rec on that one, though. We have another caller with us. And, caller, you're on the air. It's uh, 935 on KLIX. Go ahead. Hello, Bill. I was wondering about the coyotes that are out here in the south fields if there's more this year uh, i'm just being more on the road just wondering you know you know i i would guess there are more and the reason being is because we we've got such an increase in our rabbit numbers um we're really in an up cycle um they're very cyclical uh rabbit numbers we're in a high rabbit number uh cycle right now we've had a ton of voles and mice you're seeing more raptors, your, all your hawks and your owls and and things like that. And so, yeah, I, I, I see the same thing. I hear the same thing around my house. It sounds like I've got uh, uh, 10 dens of them every night, you know, when the, the pups start yipping at night. And so uh, quite a few coyotes out there this year. Want to thank you for the call. Another caller on the air with us. You're up next on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Go ahead. Kelvin, I know this might be a stupid question, but, you know, I, I got a draw at Unit 49 for a doe. Can I still apply for a, an open buck hunt or not? Well, you wouldn't be. No, if you've got, you can buy another tag if you want. What we've got going on right now is we've got second tags. You can buy the leftover. What we do is we open it up at the first of the month for residents to be able to buy non-resident deer tags. We've set a number of tags that we're going to sell to non-residents. Um, if you want to buy a second tag, you can buy a second elk tag, um, as long as we have elk tags available for non-residents, or you can buy a second deer tag. Um, and so, you, But you would not be able to apply. You've got the controlled deer hunt, so that would be your regular resident deer tag for this year. And if you wanted to get another deer tag, it would cost you, I think it's $300 as a non-resident tag. But that would allow you to be able to hunt. You know, you can buy a whitetail tag to hunt whitetail up north. Or you can buy just another uh, tag and hunt uh, bucks while you're hunting does. That answers the question. You bet. Hey, thanks for the call. Hey, we, we've got a couple of minutes before our break. And then we've got a nice long stretch too to follow that. But you have a note here on blue-green algae. And I've been hearing a lot about this lately. Oh, man. Um, this is something that we really wanted to get out there uh, st- for people to uh, know what's going on. We've got blue-green algae uh, sprouts all across the state right now. Um, and how does this concern you? Well, it can kill dogs. It can kill livestock. Um, it can be very deadly to humans. Um, a lot of times this will show up in uh, bays where the water is very stagnant. The war- water is really warm right now. We've got a lot of these, not a lot, but we're, we're starting to get, get them. We've got a Lake Fernand up by uh, Coeur d'Alene. We've got it over um, outside of uh, Boise and two or three lakes that they know of. We've got it here in Mormon Reservoir. Typically, when we see it at Mormon, it's not too long until we start finding traces of it down at Salmon Dam. You just want to be really careful. Uh, stock ponds, any place where the water is uh, doesn't have much movement to it, and is getting warm, this out these algae sprouts can come up, and they're they're very deadly. And so be careful. And uh, and uh, details probably on your website too about that. They they are. We've got it on our Facebook page. There's a bunch of links and articles on. It's at uh, Magic Valley Fishing Game Magic Valley. So we've got some postings on there on it. Um, we've what we have on there is we're just 
we're not in charge of blue-green algae. <laughs> but when it shows up, uh, the Depar uh, Department of Water Quality, DQ, will, um, will issue warnings. Uh, Southeastern Idaho Public Health District will issue warnings, and that's what we have on the website. If you want to find more, go to their websites. They'll have it on there, too, the DEQ or uh, South Central Public Health District, or go to our Fish and Game website. We've got more coming up with Kelton Hatch here on News Radio 1310, KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. He's joining us from Idaho Fish and Game. We're going to talk a little bit about some Chinook coming up. And, uh, very little, because uh, <laughs> but uh, I, big it, fish, very but, little. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but they are, season is getting ready to start. That's on the way. Joining us in studio this morning, Kelton Hatch from Idaho Fish and Game, and of course, he'll take some of your telephone calls too if you are inclined to give him a telephone call here in the last fifteen minutes of the program. Uh, but in the meantime, we got a couple of other items we need to bring up before we uh, we call it a day. It's uh, 944, it's 60, no, 70 now, uh, up to 70 on our way into the low 90s before the day is over. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Uh, Chinook season. Um, now, I have friends who, who, who this is, they think it's the greatest sport in the world um, to, uh, to actually go uh, fishing for Chinook. Because they'll give you a fight, I guess, right? Oh, yeah. Big old lunker fish, you know, they'll, they'll about pull you in. And they're very tasty. Yeah. And so a lot, lot of fun. But, you know, I'm just not that good of an angler. I I, I got I used to work in Alaska in the summers and stuff and falls and, and work up there. And I kind of got spoiled where you just cast the line in there and you caught one. I have a real rough time catching steelhead in Chinook in Idaho. I'm not a good angler. <laughs> I'm not a good angler. I'm too much. I, I think part of it has to do with patience too. You know, it's kind of like squirrel <laughs> and I'm off thinking of something else. But, um, you know, it, they are a great fish to get out. And it looks like we're going to have a really good run this year. We're anticipating about 32, 33,000 fish coming into the system. Um, it opens September 1st. Go to our fishing game website, and it's going to give you. I'd read read the things to you, but it's about oh six paragraphs long on everything. And so, uh, but just so that you know, we're we're going to have a pretty good season this year, and it's going to be on the Snake Clearwater and portions of the Salmon River on portions of all of those. And so, um, September first is just around the corner, and you can watch the counts um, on the website too to see how many fish are coming into the system and uh, get out there and have a little bit of fun. And then at the bottom, you have a note here that says nine catch and release records still open. Yeah, and a lot of people, uh, I mean, it, it's been really interesting. We uh, started a new record book for fishing, and it was catch and release. We've got so many people that don't kill fish anymore. They just like catching them. Uh, they don't kill them to take them home and eat them. They, they catch them, and then they, they release them. So we started this catch and release uh, record book. Um, we had a guy that... Uh, a while ago that set the new, I can't remember how big it was, but as a largemouth bass he'd caught, we had almost 40 pictures posted of other people's largemouth bass on our Facebook page because it's just, the angling angling groups are they're very active. Uh, a lot of people really like getting out and fishing, and it's been a huge success. But there's if you want to get your name in the record book, uh, you can get it in there for tiger muskie, a la hunt cutthroat, bullhead, tiger trout, uh, golden trout, Lake Whitefish, Flathead Catfish, uh, Gerard, Rainbow, and Splank. Um, all of those have uh, have no fish that have been registered for them as a, as a record yet. And so if you want to get in there, uh, you know, we've got 50, over 55 entries so far on other fish. And so uh, it, it's been a success. And if you want to get in there uh, and don't want to really have to catch a big fish, you can get your name in there just by catching one of these. We have a caller uh, looking to uh, jump in on the conversation Sounds as well. Sounds good. You're on the air with Kelton Hatch on News Radio 1310 KLIX. Go ahead. Uh, I just got a question. I mean, uh, about that mountain lion that, that got killed over there, uh, at what point does it make a, do you guys make a judgment call? Like, if we're camping on their property, you know, on their natural habitat, and and we kill them. I mean, isn't that oxymoron? I mean, can, can you explain what is the criteria for uh, justifying the killing like that? Justifying the killing. Well, the the and I appreciate the call, and we we get this call a lot. I mean, get this question a lot. 
Um, our main concern, my main concern is public safety. Yes, we are camping in their habitat. Yes, 95% of the time, the issues are human caused issues. Um, but I still put human life way above wildlife. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love wildlife. Um, and I'd li rather spend <laughs> time with wildlife than a lot of humans I know. However, um, we, we need to really maintain public safety. We've got big populations of, uh, if it was an endangered species or something like this, um, you, well, we still, it, it's still just a public concern. And once things start like this, um, it, it can go on. And if someone was killed by this cat, I would feel horrible. The agency would. And so we're just going to remove them from the population. Um, it's not going to, I mean, it sounds really cold and cruel and calculating, uh, but um, removing one animal from a population for the greater good to not cause a public outcry or fear or just mass hysteria uh, and things like that is better. And If better. you didn't do it in this same mountain lion, which now has a taste perhaps for human flesh, Grabbed another small child, and you would be. Uh, oh yeah, we'd be we'd be we'd be liable. But that's the least of my concern. Being liable, my concern would be. I, I just can't imagine losing a child myself, or losing someone close where I could have done something to to protect them. And so, no, he's he's exactly right. We're going into their habitat, but guess what? Where your house is is their habitat. Twin Falls is their habitat. We've just got a lot more houses here. Guess what? We have mountain lions walking down Rock Creek Canyon right through Twin Falls. They're hunting the deer. I've, I've passed them over. I've seen a mountain lion uh, crossing falls down by the Boy Scout office. This was oh, about eight or nine years ago. Cat crossing, deer out in those fields. Um, they live among us. Um, just every once in a while, we'll get these young ones that are uh, emaciated. They're hungry. Uh, they may be injured. And those are the ones we end up removing from the population because they get in trouble. Well, for thousands of years, though, people in North America have been sharing the same habitat with mm -hmm. them. It's only recently that men actually moved into homes and built villages and cities. You know, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, and the cities, I mean, really displace animals because, I mean, right here on the canyon rims where a lot of our elk and deer, a bighorn sheep was one of the main animals in this area before uh, – People moved in through here. You know, we had thousands of bighorn sheep in the Magic Valley all the way up through Sun Valley. Catch them. It's really good sheep habitat. Probably more bighorn sheep than we had uh, elk and deer by quite a ways. But as people moved in, um, easy to hunt, uh, disease got into those populations. Now we, we have more deer and elk. And so, it, you know, it's hard. That's one thing we'll continue doing. We try to, I mean, we remove bear from populations that are getting into people's uh, garbage cans in Sun Valley, Wood River Valley, uh, catch them in that area because they get habituated. I, I couldn't live with myself if a child or an adult was killed by something that we could have maintained, handled. And we have open hunting seasons on them, so it's not affecting the overall population. Now, we should point out there are two people in your business also uh, a lookout for wildlife. I, two weeks ago, I went and visited both uh, the state and federal fish hatcheries mm -hmm. uh, up in the Hagerman area and uh, got to look at uh, what was going on in the operations there in the pens. I guess mm -hmm. you call them pens or yeah. ponds. Yeah, well, and raceways. Raceways, and and there you go. There's That's an effort to try and make sure that we have these species. Oh, you bet. Well, one thing people ha have they they don't understand is Idaho Fishing Game is what we call a dedicated fund agency. We receive no money from the general tax fund. If you do not buy a hunting and fishing license in the state of Idaho or buy fishing equipment uh, or buy ammunition and rifles, you pay zero towards management of Idaho's wildlife unless you donate in some form or fashion um, on your tax taxes or something like that. The only money that goes to manage Idaho's wildlife, everybody owns Idaho's wildlife. It's owned by the people of Idaho. However, it is only paid for by sportsmen. And I think that's one thing a, uh, a lot of people miss out on is uh, they just figure, oh, you guys get taxes just like, you know, social services or, or any of these other uh, state, you know, uh, 
the the health department or county pl uh, police or anything. We don't. Ours is a dedicated fund agency paid for by sportsmen and and users of the resource. And so, uh, you know, we we try to manage it the best we can for everybody, though. Which is why probably when you go to the federal hatchery, uh, what I've noticed, it, and the difference is it looks like over there that somebody wanted to plate everything with gold because that's uh... – <laughs> I'm not even going to get to touch that one. <laughs> See, you're, you're setting me up to get yelled at by my federal buddies, and so I'm not going to do that. But, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you love wildlife, you know, buy a hunting and fishing license. You don't even have to I, – I ran into a couple the other day. They're upset at me for having a moose hunt uh, – at us for having a moose hunt down on the South Hills because they love f photographing them. However, they buy a hunting and fishing license every year just to support us because they, he used to be a hunter. His wife just, she's got names for all the moose up there, but she says, oh, there's a bunch. She says, I just hope they don't shoot my one. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, even if you didn't want to see him go, he'd probably still be pretty tasty. I, I, well, then that's what I says. I said, well, those males are worthless. You know, they're, they're around for a little bit and then we need the cows up there to raise more babies. We have another caller with us. Caller, Great. you're up next. You're on KLIX with Kelton Hatch. Good morning, guys. Morning. I, mean, I really, I really appreciate you coming on and talking. I've called in a few times, and then we've had a good conversation a few times. I, you may have already said, are you going to be over to the Cassidy County Fair later this week, or? You know, I, I I served my first two days over there. I was over there uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, and so I'm going to uh, ha – other staff is going to be over there the remainder of the week, and then we'll have another booth over at the Twin Falls County Fair and Rodeo. Well, I, I thank you. I just want to come over and shake your hand, but I'll catch you next year. Maybe you can uh, we can talk and I can get a moose permit from you or something. Well, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll have to see. <laughs> I appreciate the call. We have another caller. It's 955, and you're up next. You're on KLIX. Nope, a caller apparently. By the way, speaking of uh, speaking of what they have at the the national um, uh, hatchery, I the sturgeon. I mean, they're big enough, but I mean, obviously they're small. Uh, what I saw f swimming around there compared to what you'd see out in the wild. Well, y yeah, I mean they can get up to nine plus foot, and so uh, and we just can't afford to throw that much feed to that big of animal, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so the bigger yeah. they get, and you know, a lot of people say, "Oh, why are you guys releasing your trout so small?" And it's like. Well, it's kind of like your kids. The bigger they get, the more they eat. And so we try to get them out so that they can eat natural foods. And so, uh, but those sturgeon are pretty, they're still pretty impressive. If you haven't had an opportunity to go to one of the, the hatcheries, uh, you know, it, it is a good opportunity. I mean, we have one in Haysburg that it's cool to kind of just look around the facilities. They don't really give guided tours. Joe Chapman uh, down at the state hatchery has... Uh, a viewing pond of all the different type of fish that they raise down there and you can walk around the outside of the facilities and and talk to the staff on hand over there and uh you know it's pretty neat to get to go see those in fact i learned something about sturgeon the last couple of weeks that they actually will growl and it will sound like a dog growling you see and i i didn't know that that's you you taught me something yeah so uh, big fish yep they and are the, I, I saw a photograph of one that was caught near the oregon state line about 100 years ago that was 20 feet long yeah, he weighed in at 1,500 pounds. He was an ocean goer. And so to get that big, you know, the biggest ones we've had around here is in that 10-foot range, and those are down by CJ Strike. We've got a caller. A caller about one minute to go. You're on the air. Okay, I got two quick points. One is out by Minidoka Dam over in a place called Bishop Holes. There's a lot of ponds and stuff, still water over there, and that blue-green algae is thick over there. I don't even take my dog out there. And the other one is, I saw some people pulling hooks out of the guts of small bass the other day, and I tried to tell them just cut that line off, and that's something people ought to know. I appreciate both your points. He's he's very right. If you have a fish, any fish that you're not going to keep, that the hook is deep in them, just cut your line off and let them go. That hook will rust out in just a few days. Fish will be healthy. If you pull them out, it's a dead fish. And, so, and the blue-green algae, greatly appreciate that. If you have reports... Please post them on our Facebook page so other people will know where they're at. Um, just to let you know what it looks like, kind of looks like pea soup. Some of the ponds will have a real strong smell to them. It'll be really strong. Um, you don't want to be around it. If it gets it on your hand, get it washed off. If it gets on your dog's uh, fur, get him cleaned off with fresh water. Um, but you d need to be really cognizant. It will disappear as soon as we get some wind, some rain, and some cooler weather. Want to thank Kelton Hatch for coming by today. 
from Idaho Fish and Game. And after the fairs are all over, we'll get a chance to see you again. Yeah, or maybe before. I, I was thinking maybe we'll have to try to do this a little more often during hunting season. Not a bad idea. Uh, got, got a lot of questions and comments from people, and that would keep them updated, I would imagine. You bet. And it's fun to talk to folks and hear what they have to hear. And If you've got a question, there's 100 other people that are asking the same one, so call in. And tomorrow, by the way, on the program, in a related subject, uh, we have Forrest coming by from Washington Street uh, Pond, and he's going to be talking with us starting on a regular basis now Friday mornings uh, about firearms, firearm safety, and the like, and uh, some details on that. That'll be after 9 o'clock news tomorrow right here on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Bill Colley with you on Top Story as well. And God willing, if the creek don't rise, I'm back here tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock.